uh, Holocaust survivors and about 300 descendants like me. And I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. I know Monique, who's the past president, who's here in person. She's the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Two, also, two survivors. So we call ourselves 2G, second generation. We also have um, uh, students and teachers and uh, interested community members uh, as part of our organization. And if anybody here wants to join, there is no cost for students or uh, professors or teachers. So our goal with our organization is to make sure that people never forget what happened. But more than that, our goal is to help develop competencies in um, other people, mostly younger people. We aim a lot of our programs at students. Uh, we want to develop the competency so that it never happens again. So through lessons learned from the Holocaust, uh, we offer tools to act, to be an upstander. So when there are future um, conflicts, uh, we know there would, there are, since the Holocaust, there's been genocide after genocide. One might think after killing so many people in the Holocaust, over 6 million of one group of people just because of their religion, that perhaps the world would have woken up. But I think you all know, I don't have to list them, that, that hasn't happened. Uh, our mission says, this is our mission on the screen, our mission says we honor the, whoa, we honor the memory and legacy of survivors and victims. Well, how do we do that? So every year in April, we have a Yom HaShoah uh, commemoration, and the word Shoah means the Holocaust. Uh, we promote awareness of the Holocaust and some of the less known uh, aspects of how it happened. Many people will know concentration camps and will, might know the name Auschwitz, but so many more Jews were killed by bullets. And hence there's a photo we can't see too clearly but that was our exhibit, the Holocaust by Bullets, that was going strong in 2020. And we it was at the library in downtown Phoenix. And we moved it to Noble Library here on campus. And it was installation finished March 14, 2020. So you know what happened next, it never opened. And that summer, we took it down and shipped it back. So we're bringing that an exhibit back to this time to Hayden Library in, at the end of February. Uh, we also bring speakers, nationally and internationally known speakers. We've had speakers from other genocides like Clementine Wamaria, who was a child survivor from Rwanda, from the Rwandan genocide. We've had Jennifer Tiga come from Germany, and she is the uh, granddaughter of a commandant from the Flachau concentration camp and wrote a book called My Grandfather Would Have Shot Me because she is half uh, African. Uh, and then on April 4th and 5th, we'll have Father Patrick Dubois come. He's a French Catholic priest who coined the term of the Holocaust by bullet. So we do a lot. We think we do a lot for a small organization. 
and we have extensive programming for schools, for example, any school in the state of Arizona can ask for a paper, and now with Zoom, we can service the whole state. Uh, locally, for many, many years, we've had survivors go into the classroom to speak. Right now, we are buying books on the Holocaust or other genocides for classrooms. All the teacher has to do is ask. Um, and we have a new project where we're collecting books on the Holocaust for the Arizona uh, prison system. There are 16 libraries. And we're providing them with books. So we do a lot. So is it enough? Unfortunately, no, it's not enough at all. There have been many instances of hate crimes and anti Semitism here on ASU's campus. Uh, at a um, high school in Mesa had flyers, similar flyers. Remember in the news, there were banners hanging from the overpass of highways. We had um, uh, Black and Jewish journalists get targeted at their homes with swastikas and posters on their bedroom windows. So obviously, it's it's not enough. Here shows uh, what happened in our democracy. Uh, we had a Jewish person running for uh, office, for a statewide office. And this is his uh, poster that was in Scottsdale, up near Frank Lloyd Wright and the 101. Not exactly an area you would expect white supremacists to come and desecrate crime, but I've learned it's all over. Um, this article talks about how the Jew Jews are targeted the most uh, for any kinds of hate crimes that are religious in origin. Are you surprised? I wasn't surprised either. Because you think about um, uh, what happened in Pittsburgh at the Tree of Life and in uh, Southern California. And what we're doing is not enough, definitely. So uh, 2020, there was a survey of millennials and Gen Z. And this had really depressing data. Less, there were over 40,000 camps and ghettos in Europe during World War II. Uh, less than half in the survey could name a single camp or ghetto. They didn't even know the word Auschwitz. Um, so this study really has motivated the Holocaust Association to in, continue our efforts and to increase uh, the education programs on the Holocaust and other genocides. So starting in uh, 2018, uh, we began the process to get a bill passed mandating the teaching of the Holocaust and other genocides. And that was when I took the presidency of the organization. And I can remember at my first board meeting saying, this is my goal. And everybody has been there a lot longer than me said, never going to happen. This is Arizona. So that's all you have to say to me that it can't happen. So. I'd make sure I do my best to make it happen. So we introduced a bill in 2019. That's the bill on the top. And you can see it had lots of wear ads and it had a lot of history in it. And it was long and it was really comprehensive. And we talked about the Holocaust and other genocides. Um, we made it through the house, but that's it. So we didn't. Uh, it didn't pass. 
So in 2020, we introduced a much shorter bill. So the first bill was introduced by Michelle Udall, she's a Republican representative from Mesa, and she got it pretty far. We came back the next year, and now we have Representative Alma Hernandez, and we got it down to two sentences. All it says is we got to teach the Holocaust and other genocide at least twice between seventh and twelfth grade. So easy to remember. How can you argue with it? We make it through the House. We testified at the Senate, and then. COVID shut the legislature, and I won't go into it, but it didn't do this. So we come back this year in January with the exact same bill. And this year, although it wasn't easy, on the last day of the legislature, the bill passed. And on July 9th, the governor signed it. We have lots of help, not just the Holocaust Association. We had the help of Michael Beller and Josh Tay, who created an organization called Arizona Teaching the Holocaust, and they hired a lobbyist, uh, which you get a lot more done than me. And um, that worked. So we, um, here, you can see we uh, testified and testified and testified. We testified in person, we testified on Zoom, and we always featured our Holocaust survivors because when they say this will help prevent the hell I went through, somehow people listen. Uh, so there it is. So there is the governor signing our bill, House Bill 2241. So it is in our statutes. It went into effect, I believe, the 29th of September. So everyone should be getting instruction on it. Is that good? Yeah. That's good. It's not perfect. I'll go into later what we're missing because we're missing yet a big piece. This is a great first step. We join 17 other states that have mandates, and there's a couple others that say it's strongly encouraged, but ours is a mandate. But I'm going to go back in, I'm going to step back a minute. And in August of uh, 2020, uh, the State Board of Education, they had been on board and were supporting the bill. And of course, in that, then the bill didn't pass in 2020, but Right after that, they had made a rule change, which was almost as good as getting a bill passed. They made a rule change that and used the same language that the Holocaust and other genocides have to be taught at least twice. And so Phoenix Holocaust Association decided while they were going through the protocols to get it passed. They started in, in August, but it wouldn't get voted on till um, October. We convened what we called a task force of education leaders. Volker was on it, as well as professors from NAU, U of A, several community colleges. We had um, members of the board of Phoenix Holocaust Association. We had Arizona Jewish Historical Associate, uh, Society. And we decided with the Department of Education. So we had the support 
of the Arizona Department of Education because the school board was putting this rule and was going to have a vote on it. And so by January of this year, uh, 2021, our toolkit was available online. You can see it's on the Arizona Department of Education website. And our goal there was to provide teachers kind of a curated list of books that we recommend, books for teachers, books for students, um, training programs, curricula, uh, movies, and anything you might need for teaching these subjects. Because we know high school and middle school teachers have plenty to do. They're overloaded, they're overwhelmed. To add a topic that they themselves may not know is asking a lot. Now you might wonder why we didn't develop one curricula that we could send out to the state because you can't do that in Arizona. It's up to each school district. And so we have teamed up with a program called Echoes and Reflections. It's the uh, ADL, Yad Vashem, and the U.S. Shoah Foundation. They offer fabulous training programs for teachers. Any teacher in the state of Arizona can take these online classes that are outside of school hours. Uh, most of them are taught by uh, Kim Platt, who's a internationally renowned Holocaust educator and teaches at Dobson High School. And so we are trying our best to offer teachers support where we can. And this is what some of the topics in the toolkit. So when you say the Holocaust and other genocides, well, the Holocaust, that we know well. But there are so many, unfortunately, other genocides. How many do we pick? So we, we limited it. So in our first iteration, we, have, we cover Armenia, Rwanda, Bosnia, or the former Yugoslavia, and Native Americans. And uh, quite frankly, we felt that was probably enough for a first go round because it's hard for <coughs> teachers to uh, cover all of that. So we have tried to make this examples of genocidal violence and ethnic cleansing. So that's what we have today. And, and then we know this is a long journey and it is not over. So we teamed up with ASU and Professor Benkart and just this week, just this week, this was finally published. And this is a research study uh, to look at what's been done by other states, what's worked, a little bit what hasn't worked, what's the language in their bills, who has state commissions, who has state resource centers, do they feel that's what helps? So we really wanted to understand the key elements of successful implementation of Holocaust mandate. Because it's great to have a mandate, but if nothing happens, what good is it? It's just the paper somebody signed and some people got pens. Um, and so we know here in Arizona, we have a lot more to do. So if you're tuned in, you'll see that we will be moving forward in an attempt to get a statewide commission to get funded won't happen quickly, 
Right now, we're trying to make sure school districts know about the mandate and have access to the materials, but we're not done. One thing that makes an impact is hearing from the survivor directly. So kids who are in school today are the last generation that's ever going to be a Holocaust survivor. One of the, um, well, the man in the middle here, his name is Dr. Alexander White. He was one that had testified at the House and the Senate. He's 98. He just had a hip replacement. And he's, we believe, the one of the last, if not the last, Schindler Jew. So if you watch the movie Schindler's List, you know that about 1,200 Jews were saved. That's how Alex was saved. Alex is doing a program for right now for U of A Medical School for their bioethics um, uh, faculty, where he has recorded uh, testimony. He's a physician himself for the medical students so that they have an appreciation as well, which we're pretty excited about. So we got a grant. Uh, to create uh, a video, and we just released this video called Resilience Reflections of Arizona Holocaust Survivors. It has a teacher guide written by Kim Clef. And our goal here is if a teacher doesn't, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, testimonies available online. Maybe not close to 100,000. But this is Arizona, three Arizona survivors. We give you a teacher's guide, and we think that makes a perfect flash um, lecture and watch the video and have discussion for a high school class. This is only here to high school. Because all three of these survivors were in a concentration camp. Um, Alex and uh, the woman, Esther Bash, are the only survivors of their families. Um, and their stories are fairly horrendous. Yeah, fairly horrendous. Um, so we don't want to expose kids too young to this. So this is appropriate, I think, for university level, community college, and high school. In about two weeks, we should have a second video called Hidden Children, uh, Reflections of Arizona Holocaust Survivors. And here we have two uh, hidden children who have been taped. Um, they only survived because their parents gave them to strangers. So if any of you are parents, you can just, just like I just, and I know this story, and I just got goosebumps. I don't know how somebody can give your child to them. I mean, you have to really believe that what's going to happen is horrendous, and that it was safe to give your child to So the woman on the left was 18 months old when her parents gave her away. Her mother didn't survive. And the woman on the right was uh, eight years old and spent nine months hiding in a bombed out cellar. And some wonderful, righteous Gentile fed her for nine months. She was in France. And Marion on the left was in a convent uh, uh, in Poland. So this is what we are trying to do. Our work is not done uh, at all. And I've uh, been watching the news recently. You probably maybe have heard what's going on in Texas. And now some interpretations of their new law is they get to 
provide opposing views of any controversial uh, uh, topic. Now, to me, this is extremely frightening because there's other states that have, I believe, almost identical bills working if their way through the um, legislatures. There is no opposing view to the Holocaust. It's the most well-documented genocide on record. There is no question how many were killed, who was killed, nor who was the perpetrator. And in no case, no case of any of the trials, has a perpetrator said, this doesn't, this didn't happen, they will say, I was forced to do it. I had no choice. My family would have been killed if I didn't comply. Yes, that, but not that it didn't happen. So to me, that's reason enough that we have to keep pushing for this because we want students to learn. So when they're confronted with hatred and when they're confronted with prejudice, that they will do the right thing or we will continue after Thank you. Thank you very much, Shell. Um, but uh, Shell gave us an overview of what um, the Holocaust uh, Association is doing. But uh, to all the amazing things uh, they're doing, I would like to add one thing, uh, and that is uh, Genocide Awareness Week that will be here in, in uh, Gates U in, uh, in April uh, 2022. And really, Cheryl's leadership that makes that happen. They're uh, not in the same position that we share. So, um, um, in the kind of next segment that uh, Jason and I will be, will be leading, um, we want to talk about how to teach uh, genocide comparatively. And we just start with a simple premise, but thanks to show, we have a mandate. And the mandate, throughout its uh, various ages of iterations, has Holocaust and other genocide. So it takes the Holocaust as a paradigmatic with genocide to uh, uh, from which the vocabulary of genocide was, was established, the research methods, the oral history methods, right? And all of this comes into being because of the Holocaust. We need to use that scholarship um, and that experience to uh, inform the study of other genocides. But um, it's also very clear that there are very different kinds of resources available for the study of the Holocaust as there are for other genocides. And the mandate itself asks us to think about what they have in common. Um, so that it's not just one genocide, one classroom after another, but that students meaningfully, uh, meaningfully can link those. And hopefully, as Cheryl said, uh, um, really uh, identify uh, toxic behavior and change uh, and act if needed. So what Chase and I are going to do in the next few minutes is to think about, OK, what should such genocide uh, um, uh, comparative genocide education do, we should probably do something like teach awareness, ethics, and empathy. We will identify comparative themes uh, of survival testimony that might be helpful in establishing a kind of a comparative framework. Um, we will talk about why study uh, testimony, why is testimony so important, and what are the, uh, the problems uh, in comparative testimony. We're going to try to think about uh, the Holocaust and the London genocide as the genocides that we are most familiar with, how they might be, uh, how testimony from these genocides might be used in the classroom. And think about what are the pedagogical possibilities for such an approach, and then with the number of resources that might be important, 
on genocide testimonies, in addition to the amazing resources that Cheryl has put together in the task force. So, um, what, what do we mean by teaching awareness, ethics, and empathy? Um, let me start with the things that it should not be. Um, so, um, I think it would be a very problematic outcome if we have uh, something that uh, uh, in schools where you know, um, uh, we just teach genocide as a series of atrocities that are disconnected, inevitable, and unpredictable. Right? Uh, the story of, um, of uh, um, the world I think we find is just a series of, of disconnected uh, atrocities for the most part far away or a long time ago. I think that would be a very problematic outcome because at the end of the day, what we want to create some awareness where a student identify warning signs and realize it can happen here and now. It's not about far away and a long time ago. The, the warning signs are very simple. Another problematic outcome might be you know, dichotomies. Um, you can argue, of course, the Holocaust is a modern genocide, and Auschwitz is a testimony to a modern tragedy of death. But very often with that comes a kind of a, um, a statement about other genocides too. The Holocaust is modern, this is Rwandan genocide, they not pay uh, our genocide because it's a means of killing them, as in our case, uh, 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 machete. I think that would be a problematic dichotomy. So the thing that we want to focus on that might be a more helpful outcome uh, of a learning goal would be to think that uh, genocides have similar structures and that there's a certain ethics involved in how we compare what the outcome of these comparisons could be. Equally problematic would be an idea of hierarchies of suffering. Right? It's not about saying that one genocide is worse than another. And certainly from the perspective of an individual, there cannot be any hierarchies. Rather, it would be helpful to instill empathy. Uh, and I think we can do that by uh, showing that your common themes and survivor testimony. So if this is what we want to accomplish, it might be uh, like one positive uh, learning outcomes. Then we looked at a host of testimony from different genocides, and we felt okay, there's certain uh, comparative themes that we distill that are hallmarks of, of all genocide. Um, and of course, um, by this we can argue about these themes. Uh, you may call them different names, and testimony, right? Um, 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 testimony givers will not uh, maybe use the word prejudice. But I think it is fair to say that underlying all genocides is a form of ostracism, is a sort of a, a prejudice that, it, uh, that informs beliefs on who's the in group and who's the out group. Uh, we need to talk about violence, thinking that this may take on very, very different forms. Um, but clearly, violence is part of it. Survival and resistance, too, right? Um, the very fact of, of survival is a form of resistance, and it takes on many shapes and forms. And survivor testimonies will, of course, tell us their amazing story of survival, always to be mindful of the fact that they are few who did. Perpetrators. Are you know very very different categories, but there isn't a genocide that is without perpetrators. And even in uh, we know in 1945 in Germany, it seemed to be a country without perpetrators. Right? We know this is not true. We know that hundreds of thousands of Germans were directly involved in the murder uh, of Jews in Hungary. Um, we, but in addition to perpetrators, right? We know and survivors talk about different forms of. Um, no survivor testimony is a testimony in isolation. Even if someone is in hiding, there was someone else who uh, put them in this position or helped them or, or, uh, or from whom they were hiding. Right? This is not uh, uh, an isolated story. All uh, genocides rest on ideology. And it is interesting that uh, in survivor testimony, of course, the ideology that informs the ostracism is something that. Um, um, survivors confront um, and grapple. And all genocides end with some kind of coming to terms with the past and some form of justice. You know, uh, Stuart Eisenstadt said this is more after the imperfect justice than no justice at all. Um, so if we 
we take these themes and we argue that these can be found in our testimony of uh, all genocides, right? Um, then we can look for these and use them as, as teaching goals. What about the people of Well, Well, uh, these these uh, uh, themes are, of course, very abstract. Um, and the goal, of course, is to create universal themes and inevitably, right, abstraction would be uh, a, a problem here. But I do think that in all of them, or behind all of these, are questions of essential value, right? Um, survivors may not all these things, right, we call them, or we grapple with these, with these quite and we also want to posit that there's a whole lot to be learned from Kilgaris. So first is representation, right? Uh, the Holocaust is the third pre-modern genocide uh, that informs other genocides, but other genocides are those two shells work in particular on the curriculum uh, and have to. But we also think that it informs memory debates in the US. And some genocides in the uh, US are clearly deliberate, right? Uh, uh, the exhibition of the Holocaust in Europe started with a picture of the GI, right? That is very important. But the United States do not play the same role in all genocides. And the bystander does for him when he testified with respect to Rwanda, or it may be that uh, Americans are part of the factor that is free of their own history and our state with respect to Native Americans. And we also think that it is very important that um, there is an effort of prediction, intervention, and commemoration. And that starts with empathy for the survivors learning about structures of genocide. And I think we can identify those in this component too. So, if that's the goal, then testimonies to us are the perfect vehicle to reach those learning goals. And uh, because it is the data of the individual, but it's never just the individual, all testimonies talk about the people and we necessarily have to. Um, we believe in the kind of emotional power of, of testimony. We believe that high school students are capable of uh, uh, dealing um, with that, even if it is emotionally challenged. And we also believe that much of scholarship right now is centered on perpetrators, and with good reason. Um, but if we're focusing on perpetrators, the perpetrators are not focusing on victims and not racial incidents to conduct. So, talking about testimonies, however, also means talking about some difficult data. Um, uh, the types of testimonies differ greatly, right? This may be coming from diaries, this may be coming from letters, so things written immediately in the moment with the kind of viewpoint of that moment. They may be courtroom testimony enriched by a whole lot of other evidence, but it may be interviews done years later where the victim or the survivor has become an expert of their story, or they read a little bit, they verified their story with others. So, of course, this is a very, very different kind of testimony as uh, testimony given, say, in 1946. And you can see that. We compare, for example, David Voters reporting in 1946, given in the P cams, where he's just literally holding a microphone to people and saying, What well, was your experience? This is very, very raw. And of course, it has to be very raw. The person has, didn't have time to think about what that means. Some of the same people I interviewed then multiple times in other uh, efforts in the Fortunate Library at Yale or uh, Shoah Foundation or the Holocaust Museum. And of course, the story. Change not the content, right? But the story changed because people become experts of the story. Um, it's also very, very different stories, right? We, we can grasp the, the enormity of different experience in the fighting and resistance fight this. Um, we're dealing with very, very different people. Um, uh, it is no surprise that a large number of the Holocaust testimonies that we have come from people who are very middle class, very articulate. Read a lot, they, they have something to say. And that's good, right? There's no reason not to collect these systems, but there's another story that is much less difficult. Um, you know, so who do we interview? Um, what about their age, their gender, what are their cultural differences, their places of origin, their education levels, um, all of this matters a lot. 
And then there is a big difference in the availability, right? Um, so thanks to the Holocaust Museum, there's a whole lot of materials of it, and that's fantastic. But literally the same as Michael for other, other genocides. And um, uh, in a different format, and they also differ in, in terms of kind of painting what's been done to them. So the, the Shoah Foundation is, for example, an excellent, very well done, they met a whole lot of people, but uh, they rest on a pretty strong kind of interview and appearance, right? Um, drives me crazy, <laughs> but um, right, these are valuable sources because of this difference. So testimony is difficult, but it's not um, impossible to work with. Uh, and what it can do, and I'll start on this for the Holocaust, and then Mason will continue for Rwanda. So I think it is about you know kind of publicizing, confirming, engaging with narratives. Um, the narratives about the Holocaust stress, for example, the zeal to murder each and every Jewish person in Stephen Katz's book is is important here. And if we look at the kind of uh, testimony that we get. Um, um, and clearly, we can see that kind of zeal, that the prejudice, the ostracism, all of that uh, in the survivor testimony shows this approach that there is no escape uh, from from uh, from that language. Other scholarship, uh, particularly by Gertz Ali and, and others in that vein, just for a moment, uh, talk about the mobilization of a large part of the German population to participate in or tacitly support. Uh, uh, the genocide. And yes, we find this in testimony too. Uh, this, this constant uh, fear of quite literally your neighbor and what your neighbor might do to you uh, is something that is very radical uh, in testimony. Um, Sigmund Maman drew our attention on some time ago to the modernity of the Holocaust as an industrialized mass murder based on rational planning. And that's an important argument to be made because it speaks directly to Western Europe, right? This did not happen in a country far away, or, or um, this happened in Germany, maybe one of the most modern countries at the time. But at the same time, it also captures only a fraction of this, right? Uh, and Applebaum drew our attention to the fact that most victims of the Holocaust never saw a concentration camp from inside, but they died in ways that are much less modern than um, uh, Auschwitz may suggest. So, but testimonies capture the breadth of experiences of which the accounts are an important part, but not the only. We can uh, talk about second colonialism. Jeff Moses is a proponent of this kind of uh, scholarship, and indeed, we can find overlap and argue that the Holocaust of colonial logic led German settlers to actually place the murdered Jews. And enslaved Slavs, and we can find that in testimony too, because it is always about property, it's about land. Who takes the land? Um, who takes the house? Who takes the furniture? Who takes everything? And very often it is either the neighbors or it is imported by the Germans as settlers and leaders. So, this is just one way how you know, these testimonies can confirm, problematize, uh, and, and work in the classroom. Um, uh, and you can find this later. Okay. Here's one. Did you talk about that? Okay. We can do something similar with the Rwandan genocide. And, and I'm going to put up on the left side uh, kind of four. Uh, sort of many common conceptions of what the Rwandan genocide was. Um, many of these are familiar to you. Uh, you. You might get some of these from like Hotel Rwanda or if you were reading news reports or something like that when it was actually happening. You may have heard these kinds of ideas. They sort of floated around and trickled down to us. And that is that it was a short genocide. It was 100 days. That it was quote unquote primitive or pagan. Um, or that it was some kind of archaic tribal conflict. Um, and obviously, these are not separate things that are usually working together uh, as they're as the presented. Um, but thinking through, working with 
uh, testimonies from both perpetrators as well as survivors can helpfully problematize what I see is, is kind of less than helpful historical conceptualizations of what the Rwandan genocide was. So for example, um, do some of these uh, testimonies, um, it becomes clear that like there was a civil war going on. It's not necessarily uh, a thing that's always included when, when you might get bits and pieces about what the Rwandan genocide was, but it nevertheless was, was an essential piece of, of why things developed in Rwanda in 1994 the way that they did. Um, that is that the, uh, the RPF, the, the predominantly Tutsi-backed RPF, invaded from, from uh, Uganda, which is just to the north uh, of Rwanda, and then it's within this context in the early 90s where you have this, this insurgency that the, uh, the genocide takes place. Um, to, to the idea that it's sort of archaic or primitive, um, actually there were a number of both kind of literal tools of modernity that you might think of like identity cards, uh, the radio, other kinds of print media, um, in, in, in especially sort of the, the, the ideological tools that we get with modernity, like race. Um, where did these groups come from? Who are they? Are there essential differences between uh, perceived different races? Those kinds of ways of viewing Rwanda in, in, that became quite politically pervasive um, from the 19, especially from the 1950s onwards, were of modernity that came for the large part through European colonialism. Um, so the idea that it was sort of just tribal, pagan, primitive, again, uh, Rwanda was held up as a model of Christianization. It was a success story, for, especially for Catholic missionaries. Um, it was, uh, there was a process, uh, sometimes called, uh, usually they would use the French word, but the tornado, uh, a swat of uh, conversions to Catholicism that included the Lord, most of the Lord court in the royal family uh, in the 1930s. And from that point, Rwanda is dedicated to Christ the King. And uh, so, depending on how you count it, roughly 8 to 90 percent of the country is Christian. And you see this come out in the testimonies very, in some cases, extremely graphically and tragically because churches were often um, the sites of some of the, the largest and most brutal heart-wrenching stories of the genocide. And this is priests, nuns, pastors, turning in their own parishioners in many cases, um, holding them up yeah. and then inviting the, okay. the, the militias in, um, uh, sometimes to throw bombs, grenades, uh, machine guns, and so on. Um, the idea that it was a tribal conflict, as if this somehow is a self, uh, self-evident explanation, uh, kind of overlooks the fact that a lot of these conceptions of the tribes come from a European-derived anthropology. Uh, that these victims and, and perpetrators spoke the same language, shared the same land, shared the same political structure, intermarried, um, and so on. And so you see these kinds of conflicts. Uh, or you see how the Rwanda genocide was perceived, especially among survivors, and you can see how these different pieces, which you can find in a variety of testimonies of survivors as well as perpetrators, can help provide a more nuanced reading or understanding of what caused uh, different things that led to the genocide, as well as how different people experienced it, uh, endured it, survived it, tried to rebuild after it, uh, and so on. Um, moving from this, both uh, from, the, from the Holocaust, thinking about testimony with the Holocaust as well as the Rwandan genocides, um, we developed um, a pedagogical approach um, that, that centered survivor testimonies and, and how we thought genocide could be taught uh, in a historically grounded but also sort of ethically responsible way. Um, and so there are, I think, some important pieces for teachers uh, to, to keep in mind. One, obviously, 
foregrounding survivor testimony is speaking directly to this new mandate, but also speaks to these other high school standards that are in Arizona. Obviously, other states have, uh, many of them have, have similar kinds of language on their uh, social studies and high school standards as well. Um, but this can be a, a really powerful and important resource. Uh, and to make it somewhat easier to um, negotiate for teachers as well as students, we developed along with our, our colleague, uh, Lauren Harris, who works in history education, uh, what we call an analytic reporting form that sort of walks students and teachers through some basic questions to ask of, um, of really, in some, in some sense, historical sources in general, but gen genocide survivor testimony. Uh, specifically, kind of groups, but all of these stuff will be quite quickly. Um, and what we at, what we do through that form is sort of give some basic instruction about the kinds of things to look for when you're looking at a historical source. Um, some definitions of, for example, the comparative themes that Volker addressed a few minutes ago. Um, researcher information, information about the person. So where did the testimony come from? Who recorded it? What organization perhaps paid for it or edited it? What is hosts it? Um, is it edited? Is it not edited? Those kinds of things. Um, thinking about the broader context and how that testimony might speak to larger contextual issues or um, other kinds of events that might be more familiar. Um, they provide summary of the testimony, notable quotes, and then they we have, which I'll show you an example in just a minute, um, some sections to draw out which themes does the testimony seem to be speaking to. You know, I think it's quite rare uh, and certainly not the goal to suggest that all themes are always present in every testimony. They're given for very different reasons, of course. Um, so it has students thinking kind of in those sorts of categories uh, across general centers. Um, here's one uh, example. This is from a, a study that we ran with uh, a couple of classrooms in the valley. Uh, and so this is a student's handwriting that you can see here. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, copy of, of the form. And the two categories that they're writing about, uh, and this is from uh, a testimony dealing with the Rwandan genocide or conformity and ideology. And they say that these themes are present, both present in the testimony that they read. Uh, for those of you who might have a, a bit of a trouble reading the, the handwriting, I'll just read the one for conformity. The student writes, conformity during the genocide is clear in the victims. Tutsi and moderate Hutus were targeted. If one did not stand with the rebels, they would be plowed down by them. Uh, the rebels here in Ethan to groups like Tantra Ahmed, who did uh, a lot of the more brutal killing. Um, from the same study, though not necessarily the same student uh, work that I just read from, you can see here these are the kinds of quotes that they pulled out that were sort of left an impression upon them. Um, Save the future generation. We waited and nobody came. The angels have left us. And in response to the question, why did you choose these words? Uh, the student wrote, they contrast with everything in my life. And then they have another quote here from the testament, how difficult it was to get to school. Sort of with the idea that uh, this testimony is from a young woman who spoke about being taught by the bus going to school and how long that school ride was, um, how challenging it was. To sort of sit there and just have people hurl invectives at her um, day after day, and how difficult that became, sort of into 1993, 1994, and sort of the, the toll that, that took on her even before the, the genocide started. Um, another part of, of this kind of comparative way of thinking about testimonies um, is, is available here. And this is one example. On the left is a, a, a testimony from the Rwandan genocide, and on the right is a testimony from the Holocaust. The idea that um, uh, this is sort of a visual way of, of thinking about what's distinct about the two testimonies and perhaps the two genocides. And then as you move towards the center, the 
the students are asked to identify things that are perhaps a bit closer, a, a bit similar among the, the testimonies, and then the things that are common to both of them in the very middle. Um, and this was, uh, this seemed to be quite a, a helpful visual tool in a lot of students. Uh, you can see here, you know, put um, some extra effort into it in terms of, you know, a number of them drew different things and stylized it to emphasize different words or phrases. Um, but again, sort of leaving space both for particularity and uniqueness, as well as sort of those things that are encouraging. What do these two testimonies that come from very, very different historical events um, nevertheless tell us about something like Jason um, in general? Um, in thinking about sort of using this in, a, in the context of a high school classroom, I would think that sort of this approach to teaching something like genocide um, is really quite important from a student's perspective um, because it shows, it allows students to, to do original, what we would call here authentic tasks, but original historical research with primary sources, which is really like the heart of of what historical inquiry uh, is about, should be about engaging with uh, those sources that are produced in and around the events themselves, hearing from people who are directly impacted by them. And it, it engages students in that process at the, at the high school level, which I think is important. Doesn't simply leave it to sort of secondary uh, type sources to make history. It also encourages a different kind of contextualization. And that is not just sort of placing events in a kind of a timeline or, or some sort of broader frame, but contextualizing individual experience with respect to these sometimes what we call world changing events. Um, so you also have to think not only about how this individual's this testimony might be reading. Um, was impacted by that, interacted with it, maybe affected something within it, but also sort of using that to also think about how the source came to you. So you're contextualizing the source and it's a way to you're maybe changing your conceptualization of the so, And in giving or at least suggesting some comparative uh, themes as, as a kind of uh, analytical through one, so that these things aren't simply hanging on something like the overwhelming emotional traumatic nature and kind of just not having anything to connect those things to conceptually. It can be a way to perhaps uh, reduce some of the emotional uh, impact. Not reduce the impact, but reduce the the, uh, the sense that there's not nowhere to put this except for being overwhelmed. Now we'll conclude here. We'll have these links included uh, as, as resources for testimonies themselves. These are not, some of these links do have kind of secondary explanatory uh, uh, resources, especially the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. But these are places where you can find open access um, survivor testimonies from a, a number of different genocides. And we'll have these posted in the comments. Uh, we'll be posting the link. So, so that's the conclusion of the presentation. Thank you uh, on behalf of Walter and Cheryl for, for joining us, but those of you in person as well as others online, and we can take um, a, a few questions or, or comments um, at this time. Were you able to gather any feedback from my teacher about this topic? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Maybe. Would you mind if I take my mask off? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the things that struck us between sort of having these ideas and then trying to develop even what we regard as a fairly uh, concise curriculum, you know, uh, what we had developed was more or less a four to five day sequence 
um, even even that pretty pretty challenging for some of the classrooms just because they're so blessed to cover a, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I think that that was just enlightening to us because we we had been so we were ignorant of, of a lot of the constraints that high school teachers are under um, when they're teaching uh, even things that are required. So. Um, I, I think, um, so that was one point in terms of making sure that the resources, um, even curricular resources, have to fit a fairly finite amount of time um, that you have to even teach something as complicated as the Holocaust in, in some in some classrooms. So I think that was that was a part of the feedback that, that I took from it. I think um, a lot of the comparative things seem to mostly be helpful. Some of them, I think the way that we defined them, students found a little bit confusing, like ideology. Uh, I, I know a number of them seem in, because we got all of the reporting forms and visual organizers back. Um, a lot of them obviously connected with quotes like the ones that I've shared, and those were more common. Um, I think a lot of them seem to struggle with having unequal background knowledge, especially with the water. Um, even, even where you've got you know, some problematic common knowledge around the Holocaust or World War II, there's, a, there's just more <laughs> in American culture to connect to World War II than there is to Rwanda. So that unevenness really was quite apparent. That there was less to kind of connect where I read about East Africa for 15 years. You know, when I would see maybe some detail that cued me into something really interesting or different, that, that was that was often lost, right? Where where you would um, just because they don't they don't have the, the background to, to understand that. So providing a bit more background for for other genocides in terms of just where is Cambodia, where is Guatemala, where is Rwanda, what are their histories? Um, that's that's an enormous challenge in and of itself, even before you get to sort of how do these events unfold in, in these different times. Um, those are some things that stand up to me. Did, did you want to add anything? Yeah. So there wasn't a question, but a comment from one of um, our online attendees saying, hello from Phoenix College. As an educator and daughter of a Holocaust survivor, um, thank you for hosting this seminar. Given the new legislation and trends in our society, uh, teaching these aspects of history in present day are more important than ever. So just a big thank you. I um, have more of a question or a comment kind of tap on. Um, but one of the things I noticed fairly effective in teaching comparative genocide is with Rwanda and Cambodia specifically, a lot of uh, survivors, but especially children survivors, are the age of some of the students and or you know college students these days. So I, I noticed that you know a big trend is Holocaust survivor testimonies. Is there any implementation of kind of the narratives of these children that you know have this that, that they are in the same kind of age group as the high school students? Have they been able to speak about their experiences um, and what that's like to show that genocide isn't something that happened 100 years ago? It's something that you know people who are the same generation as you experienced it. So I just didn't know if that was, if there's any of those type of resources available. That's a, that's an interesting question. I, I do think that as far as I remember, uh, in the study that we, that we did, we, I think, I mean, for each one, we had maybe what, like six testimonies. Um, and a, a lot of them picked up on places, you know, like, like the like the girl who was going to school, right? I mean, so a lot of the survivors 
spoke, you know, were, were reasonably young when this was happening. And so they were speaking as teenagers or sometimes, you know, they were sometimes younger. Um, and they're not particularly old now. I mean, I, I say that because they're my peers. <laughs> Probably if you're rather old to a 15 year old now. Um, and so a, I do think that a number of those stories are, in terms of Rwanda, are stories of youth survivors. Um, I think in, when it comes, uh, maybe I'll go a little bit more academic with it. When it comes to sort of thinking about what the Rwandan genocide is now in Rwanda, it's, it's in a tricky spot for a number of reasons. Um, but one is that you sort of have the coming of age now of a generation that doesn't remember. And you know, now they're young adults up to you know, almost 30 now as being older ones. Um, and so the politics of memory about the genocide of the are impacting this in the sense that. Whereas you might have some older testimonies that would, that scholars have found that would deviate from what you might call the orthodox government approved narrative of what the genocide is. I don't know that you're going to find that in, in among some of the younger ones who are, who are kind of thinking of the second generation, so to speak, that are coming of age now. Um, in part because it's technically illegal to discuss some of those things. Um, so I, I, that's, that's a tricky element of how memory gets recorded with respect to the Rwandan genocide and how it becomes transmitted. I think there are different scholars like Tim Longman or Jenny Burnett who, are, who have written on this and made some really interesting things about how kind of counter memories of the 1990s are still very much alive, um, particularly among Hutu women. Uh, that's what Jenny Burnett uh, researches. Um, but how those kind of become public is not, they're, they're not public. I mean, I think that's that's a part of the problem. So they you wouldn't have access to them if you're if you're like me, you know, if you're kind of looking for them online and all databases. Um, so that's that's a that's a challenging piece of this in terms of um, how this memory is, is passed along because it's now in the context of Rwanda, since a lot of Rwandans are still in Rwanda, there is a diaspora community. But How these things become incorporated or not in, in something like a national database is, um, I think, for the most part, they're not, or, or where they are, they're, they're, they're not likely to deviate from the kinds of things that you would otherwise be pretty likely to hear about the patients. Um, and I, I think that's a challenge. I think that's a, that's a historiographical challenge, but it's also like a, a world change. training second generation speakers. We have probably um, 25 uh, trained and we will send them out to classrooms. I used to in the day when we could go into a classroom, I would speak. Um, but while we have survivors alive, if a teacher requests, that's who they want. But we have second generation speakers, even third, 
we have uh, a number who have written books, most write books about their family. Some are writing books about the inherited trauma of genocide. And so there's a number of books along those lines. Um, our next video, I received a grant to do survivors, and then next year it'll be on second generation. Uh, so I think we're ready. We, uh, the organization I'm, I had right now used to be called Phoenix Holocaust Survivors Association for its first 35 years. Um, but as the survivors, unfortunately, have died, and we have so few left, um, the second generation, you know, Moni, myself, we have to step up um, to not quite take over, but, but to provide that kind of leadership that the survivors aren't able to. I just had a comment, and I think it's very tangential out here. But again, like you said, one of my first um, thoughts was geography. Where do these things happen? Where do I fit more? The other thing that I see that could be so um, crucial in this discussion is that the idea of what a refugee is, the lost land, the whole of refugee is. What are they seeking refuge from? Um, is the idea of well, people just want to come to the United States? So I think this whole um, program study will be very helpful to our understanding of current people, of their experiences, whether it's the news or people from Somalia or you know, whatever. And, uh, Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, one of the ways that I have framed Rwanda in class is, I mean, it's, it's almost the size of Maricopa County. And so if you think of the entirety of, of what happens in the Rwanda genocide, it's, it's happening in Maricopa County, essentially. I mean, so it's, even that for me was, was a helpful kind of way of thinking, you know, where, where would I go in Maricopa County <laughs> if, if something like this were to, to take place? It's not, um, I think there is a kind of, in part because the United States is geographically quite huge. It may be because we're, we're prone to be egocentric. You know, there, there is a, a tendency to think, oh, it's like, it's, only, it's like essentially the size of the United States when it's, it's not. Um, so, so thinking geographically, I, I think can, can I, I think is important for a number of reasons. But one is that it, it find ways to have history take place for students' imaginations within the spaces in which it happened, um, and and to kind of make that a bit more concrete. Um, I, I think are, can be really important tool. All right. Um, thank you so much for coming. It, uh, it's a pleasure to get to know you a little bit. If you have a little bit of time, uh, please step in the hallway because we have uh, an artist here right now and we have two speakers. I mean, a very big kind of world. We also have a piece of the Berlin Wall here that uh, my colleague Becky uh, brought here. Um, I don't see it or anything. Um, so um, uh, yeah, uh, step in and take a look. Um, the project has